welcome everybody um, to our session. Go global with your startups and welcome yeah, to our tour, our world tour in 60 minutes. Uh, I'm glad that so many uh, join from here and especially glad that uh, the panelists are joining from yeah, all over the world, one could say. We come to that in a minute. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is uh, Katja Lasch. Uh, Katja, I'm the director of the German Center for Research Innovation and also of the German Academic Exchange Civil Service in India, better known in India as DART. And I will, yeah, I have the honor and pleasure to moderate the session today. Uh, we start in discussion with my dear colleagues, which you see here on the slide and which you see in a little bit. Um, on, a, on a larger screen, um, that we would discuss a bit the entrepreneurship and startup scenes in uh, the five countries where the German centers for research and innovation are hosted. And also that we would discuss a bit uh, what to do with science based uh, entrepreneurship in an international um, context. So in 2020, the startup economy created over 3.8 trillion US dollar value, and the years are close to 280 billion US dollar venture capital investments. So what one can see is that the startup field is an economic growth factor. And we also can see that uh, besides the economic growth, there is a diversification on the global entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is quite remarkable. So if one looks in the global entrepreneurial economy report, it analyzed last year 300 uh, ecosystems. In 2018, this number was just 60. So you can see the massive uh, growth which has taken place over the last couple of years. And that's also why we will discuss five countries today. And by the way, among the top 40 global innovation ecosystems, we find amongst others Delhi, where I'm located, Sao Paulo, where Sarun Metz, who is connected, is located, New York, where Katrin is uh, connected to, Tokyo, where Axel is, and under the top 100 emerging systems, also Moscow are so quite um, important countries to be represented here today. The deep tech sector remains the fastest riser, accounting for about 30% of capital invested in tech globally since 2015, so a really strong force. And bringing the research results from the lab to the market is an imperative of today, and one can see this also in policies of governments. But what we mean when we talk about academic and science-based entrepreneurship, and I had a long discussion with Katrin on that, who is present here on the panel, what do we actually mean and what we are talking about? Academic entrepreneurship addresses mechanisms by which academic research can be transferred to the markets and such activities and mechanisms are licensing, academic spin-offs, collaborative research and a lot of others. So to sum it up, activities that are directed towards the commercialization of scientific findings. And today policymakers around the globe counting on entrepreneurship and startups to provide the engine of economic growth. And they are fostering transfer initiatives and try to interlink science and research with entrepreneurship. So in research and uh, science, international cooperation is an imperative and we are knowing this. So for researchers and scientists, it's, it's an essential not just to exchange ideas within their discipline in their own countries, so international outreach is yeah, the core discipline, I would say. Even as startup founders tend to focus at the beginning of their journey on the local and regional markets, an early international outlook can be helpful for personal and business development, and that's what we are going to discuss today. So when we talk about internationalization of academic startups, very often we just focus on exploring and upscaling new markets. So it might is immediately, oh, I want to bring my startup into a new market. But there are a lot of different models for international cooperation. Um, and going international can be quite challenging. Um, and there are different support mechanisms who support startups, but also incubators who want to internationalize. And we will take that up in the discussion a bit later when we talk about the offers the German Center for Research and Innovation have to make. You see here a panel of the German Centers for Research and Innovation. The federal government of Germany has been actively shaping the internationalization of its higher education research and innovation system, with scholarships, project funding, but also with new institutions. And one support mechanism uh, is or are these five centers for research and innovation, DWIH, or as we call them in German, DWIH, which are placed in important uh, countries which have a scientific relevance to Germany. They are placed in Japan, in Russia, in India, Brazil, and the US. The German Center for Social Research Innovation are financed by the German government and are managed by the German Academic Exchange Service. So what we are doing all over the world, we are providing a platform for academic and uh, for academic and research exchange between Germany and these countries. 
And one of the activities is to foster international academia industry ties. And as the DWIH has an age in their name, innovation is one topic they are focusing on. And one part of it is science based entrepreneurship and startups, and that brings us to the panel of today. So we support players also in this field. With this discussion today, we want to give an outlook on five innovation ecosystems, which is a challenge in 60 minutes. We want to discuss the growing startup field in these economics, but we also want to discuss internationalization and the support mechanisms available uh, by the German government. I'm glad to see already 59 participants, which is great and which is a common effort of all of us together to promoting this event. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat. We will reply them into the chat or will them take up in the discussion. So let me introduce our panel here and I'm very, very glad that it's actually the first time that the five houses are coming together in a public event and are discussing and I'm so glad that all my dear colleagues are here with me today. So uh, let me welcome Dr. Katrin Paola. Paola. Katrin, welcome and you're connected from New York. Early bird today, no? What is the clock at the moment, Katrin? It's 7.08. 708, okay. <laughs> Katrin is a trade and FDI specialist, an expert of market and customer intelligence with a demonstrated track record of fostering successful international collaboration across industry segments and new business fields. She has done a lot of things. I will not uh, uh, repeat them all right now because we would lose uh, on time, but she's a strong relationship builder and she is the program manager or the head of programs of the German Center of Research and Innovation in New York. And she will give us an outlook into the US, of course. Second in the line is Axel Karpenstein. Axel is connected from Bonn to us. Uh, he is currently based in that as a senior research officer, but has a strong background in Japanese and Chinese studies. Actually, he has worked and lived in Japan for quite a time and has been active in the business and academia sector, so as well as catching well connected uh, to these two yeah, worlds, one could even say. And I um, want to congratulate him as he is the designated director of the German Center for Research Innovation Tokyo at the DAD Regional Office in Japan. So congratulations and looking forward to your contributions. Third in the line is uh, Søren Arthur Metz. Søren is uh, connected from Sao Paulo to us, so from Latin America, and he is a graduate in business administration and holds also an MBA in management and environmental studies. He has been in Brazil quite a time since 2012, and he is the senior regional manager for Latin America. But today he is joining us in his function as the chair of the board of the German Center for Research and Innovation, and he has a strong record in dealing with entrepreneurship and uh, yeah, with uh, the startups in the region of Latin America. So welcome, Servant, to our panel. And last but not least, Mikhail Rusakov, who is the program manager of the DBH Moscow. He yeah, has been with the science scenes and science management scene in Moscow for quite a while. He has, he has been working with that. Then he was uh, overseeing uh, the unit for science and research in the German embassy for Moscow and then returned to the German Center for Research and Innovation, where he's currently heading the programs and is into program development. So how are we going to proceed today? And I asked my dear panelists, uh, as we are in an entrepreneurship event, to give it a try for a pitch presentation, not competition. It's not a competition, it's a presentation. So uh, I asked everybody to prepare two slides and uh, we would start with a short presentation of the innovation ecosystems. Uh, so a travel around the world in 10 minutes to give some highlights. And afterwards, uh, we are going to discuss a couple of uh, questions. Um, and please, everybody, feel free to raise your questions, comments in the chat, and, uh, uh, and we will take them up a bit, a bit later. So then over to you, Axel. The floor is yours. We head first to Japan, and your two minutes are running. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction, Katja. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Very happy that we could all get together. I'm also very happy that I can present actually a very interesting story about Japan. So it's a good thing maybe that I can start. Because um, only 10 years ago, Japan didn't really have a, a noticeable startup scene to speak of. Um, was dominated by large um, companies, um, it was established labor practices prevented basically a, a vibrant um, startup scene from developing, but that has changed a lot in, 
preparation for our talk today, I, I talked to several people connected to the startup scene in Japan, in Tokyo especially, um, over the past couple of weeks. And, and you can get a feeling for this, this um, excitement of, a, of a, a very vibrant scene that is currently uh, being developed in Japan. Um, Japan itself, I have a long, as you mentioned, I have a long history with Japan. I always like to point out it's the leading innovative um, country anyway. It's been investing um, above 3% um, of GDP in, in science and technology for a long time. So it's an interesting country to start with. Um, but let me walk you through the, uh, the, the key indicators um, to describe the startup scene there. And we've, Katya, you, you were very um, good in that you gave us a template so we can, we can basically compare um, different values. You can see here, um, both an estimate of the, uh, the, the volume of um, venture capital that is um, being um, invested into new startups. And you can, and you, there's also the number of the, um, the startup companies themselves. And you can see this tremendous development over the past 10 years or so. Um, we've gone up from, from a volume of less than 1 billion US dollars um, in 2012 um, to um, over five billion dollars in 2019. The number of startup companies itself has also risen. It has dropped, as you can see, although um, which is partly due to the Corona effect. Also, the investment has, has um, dropped a little bit. Um, but as I will show you on the next slide, um, this this number shouldn't deceive you. Um, we picked the number of unicorns, for example. The number also has gone up in Japan quite a bit. In 2018, Japan had only one. It now has six. Um, the increase itself already is quite noticeable. It's also important to note Japan is a country where um, there's traditionally there has been a lot of pressure on companies to um, to go public early. So they, they naturally drop out, out of the, um, the definition of unicorns. And the fact that they, they list rather quickly, um, I think also because there were some, some changes to the, the Japanese stock market, the Tokyo stock market in 2018, I think that also accounts actually for the drop that we can see in the, the overall number of startups. Um, there's a tremendous number of, of science-based startups, um, startups that are originating from universities. The um, Japanese government has been investing um, a lot in, into this area. Um, a little bit further below here, I, I can't give you an overall number of the, um, the amount of public funds being invested in this area, but there's a new um, fund, um, a public-private shared investment fund um, through which the Japanese government invests close to a um, billion US dollars. Um, um, so there, there are a lot of one, Axel, one more minute to go. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, so you can see it, it's been um, developing um, significantly. Um, I think we can also see there there are many more um, independent venture companies um, nowadays, um, which are slowly taking over from the big corporations of the banks that have traditionally provided capital. Um, my notion is that um, attitudes are also also changing. Young people, they, they used to go straight from college to, they, they try to get into a large Japanese company because that was where you wanted to be. There's much more risk taking. There's also much more admiration for for um, independent entrepreneurs. They are the, um, the, um, the, the heads of SoftBank, Dakuten, Uniqlo, companies that you've probably heard of. Masayoshi um, Son, the, the president of SoftBank, he's, he's established a huge, um, venture capital fund, um, the Vision Fund, um, and and these are things I think that that are creating a momentum currently in Japan. So it's a fascinating time. Um, we can talk about the areas that are relevant later. Japan in itself, artificial intelligence, fintech currently um, serves a strong um, 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 momentum. Um, it's also important, I think, for German startups uh, to note that Japan has a strong interest in sustainability. Um, so I think there's definitely a chance to find an interesting market, an attractive market in Japan. Um, and maybe to close, um, it's important that there are a lot of um, initiatives now, public initiatives, um, ventures. Um, there's in Tokyo, for example, there's the the Exhub Tokyo, the Shibuya Startup Support. There, there are um, ventures to connect businesses. The Venture Cafe Tokyo, uh, to mention one. There's the German Chamber of Commerce, which is also very um, engaged in this area. So there, there are a lot of ways actually to get into the current market. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Axel. No and, uh, apologizes for pressuring, but we have uh, quite a tour uh, ahead of us. So my role also today is it to, uh, yeah, to present the the Indian part of the of the 
of the story. So let me take you through India and to, to explain you why India is an interesting market and what's ongoing in India at the moment. So I'm sure maybe you did not know that India has more than 40,000 officially registered startups and it's broadly calling itself the third largest startup system of the world. And the growth, as you can see here in the slide, has been tremendous over the last yeah, four, five, five years, starting with 500 startups and leading into 41,000. As of end 2020, uh, India has spawned 38 unicorns and is yeah, coming in at the third position after China and the US currently. And apropos fast growing in, uh, in April 2021, India alone had six unicorns in just four days. And I think that tells something about the dynamics um, of the system here. And we are not just talking about small business around the corner. And you see this here in the numbers. So the uh, venture capital invested in India has been 70 billion US dollars in 2020. With more than 1.3 billion inhabitants, the Indian market is huge and one would guess that startups focusing on commerce are the main contributors um, to these unicorns and uh, as well india is known for innovation at the low cost of frugal innovations but surprisingly science-based and deep tech startups playing quite a significant role in india and you can see that 19 percent of the uh, the startups are active in deep tech and science uh, based and they build more complex and smart solutions across industries. So hot sectors at the moment are fintech, health tech overall in the startup field. But if we look in, into uh, the deep tech startups, so it's AI, it's Internet of Things, blockchain and a lot of other things uh, which the Indian uh, startups at the moment are addressing. And one could also, by the way, look in architect, who is a fast growing sector in uh, the startup scene in India. I found it when I had a look at the numbers surprisingly to know that 8% of all the global unicorns have their technology and innovation center in India. So innovation is really done on the ground, not just for India, but also for uh, other countries. So that was a number which I found quite astonishing. So there's a lot of scope for cooperation and supporting science-based startups. And most of these science-based startups we know are incubated at research and higher education institutions. And you see here on the slide that we have, and the number of incubators is not quite clear. And I think that's a takeaway for everybody of us when we were collecting all the numbers. We had a discussion just beforehand. Numbers are a bit, bit shaky, um, but what we know we, we are presenting here. So more than 320 incubators uh, are in India at the moment and more than 50 are placed in research institutions. And one can find these incubators all over the country with hotspots, of course, in Delhi, Bangalore, and Mumbai. And the development in the fields of science-based startup is not stopping here. Axel also mentioned uh, the funding scheme. So we have a new funding scheme in India, up the new start seat, uh, the new startup India seed funding scheme, which is going to support over the next four years, 3,600 startups, and India is going to invest in these science-based startup, 120 million US dollars. So what to keep in mind about India is, as always in India, when we talk about India, the system is huge in numbers, but there are a lot of good opportunities in the field of science-based startups. To be it to cooperate with an incubator or to partner up with a science-based startup, to upscale maybe their own technology to an attractive market and also to attract for German incubators innovative startups to Germany. So, so far so good from my side. And now I would hand over to Mihai who is giving us a short outlook on the startup scene in Russia. Mikhail, over to Moscow. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mikhail Rusakov. I'm a uh, program coordinator of the German Center for Research and Innovation in Moscow, in Russia. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to say that I'm delighted to be here today. And thank you very much to my colleagues in New Delhi for the organization of this, uh, this um, great event today. I'd like to inform you, first of all, I'd like to uh, to provide you with a few informations about the general situation in Russia concerning the startup market, uh, although it's generally believed that Russia is strong only in uh, basic research and basic research uh, in fundamental sciences. Uh, Russia is also strong in such applied science, like, for example, in uh, IT. But uh, and uh, but the topic of the development of uh, startup ecosystem is relatively uh, new for Russia. The Russian startup market started uh, to grow actively uh, at the beginning of 2010, 
And, but however, it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, up to that time, uh, there were a few projects in the country that uh, showed uh, rapid growth and uh, reached the capitalization of $1 billion and more. But nevertheless, it's about the beginning of this decade when uh, numerous venture capital funds were created and many development programs uh, for in innovative entrepreneurs were launched. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, both government and private, uh, private structures are interested in the uh, regional and global development of the startup system. Because the development of startups in the subjects of the Russian Federation is important because most of regional economies have some uh, kind, some kind of uh, priorities. And that startups can work uh, to develop uh, the area in, Yekater in Yekaterinburg, for example, developing uh, innovative solutions for large industrial enterprises in Germany, for example, for oil production and, and so on. Um, anyway, 10 years ago, new uh, structures and new organizations began to emerge, and among them were, for example, Skolko Foundation or the Russian Venture Company, uh, the Foundation for Small Innovative Enterprises, uh, FASI, and IADF and uh, and other, yeah. But uh, the infrastructure is being created and developed gradually. However, area of these organizations has to uh, find its place uh, in the uh, in the market. Uh, there is a tendency and aspiration from the side of the government for development of the startup system. There are new programs and initiatives uh, initiatives uh, such as the National Project of Science and Universities or the initiative platform for university technological entrepreneurship that uh, built a, uh, the framework uh, for the for the growing of the startup system and ecosystem in Russia. Um, as for but now I'd like to before we provide you with some uh, uh, numbers, the total number of unicorns is uh, various from one to three. <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not much, but um, it, uh, much is difficult to say on which market this, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the startups get, uh, get their money. Uh, the venture capital investment amounts uh, at about uh, 702.8 million dollars, and the uh, the focus of the prominent areas of science-based startups uh, changed during the last uh, year. It's more the educational technology, and you can uh, startups, science-based startups in educational. Uh, educational online platforms uh, are now on the first place. AI and big data and uh, robotics uh, uh, were the main topics in the last in the last last years as well. Uh, but health health healthcare uh, due to the pandemic uh, uh, is is one uh, is is now one of them of the um, uh, prominent areas of, of the startups. The number of uh, the number of incubators uh, is uh, 91. There, uh, there are 91, incub uh, 91 incubators in Russia at all, and 19 accelerators at universities of overall uh, uh, 103. Okay, uh, what uh, and I'd like to uh, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, there are such Difficult difficulties, uh, for example, the bureaucracy and the, this topic, as I have already said, is new for Russia. Uh, but it uh, but it gives uh, at the same time the opportunity to uh, uh, to uh, to start uh, to go on this market on the uh, uh, on the Russian market and to take. Uh, niche in this market. Maybe it's an opportunity, but that I can say a few words a little later. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Mihai. And then, yeah, let's drop continents. And uh, over to you, uh, Zerlin. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Katja. And I, I um, hope that I will stay within my two minutes. Um, and just to give you, um, we we all heard a lot of numbers from all my other colleagues from Russia, from Tokyo, from uh, from India as well. And um, just to give you an example of of the growth potential within uh, within Brazil. So we started in 2011 with 600 uh, startups, and now we have 20 times uh, uh, this number, 12,000. In 2020, you saw Katya's numbers, uh, which are much more, uh, much more um, impressive. But you have to consider that we only have 220 million inhabitants um, in Brazil, and not 1.2 billion. Um, and still, in comparison, and now I want to um, to link this a little bit to uh, to what Alex um, uh, said. Uh, he talked about the SoftBank Vision Fund. There's a SoftBank Vision Fund uh, dedicated to Latin America, which is based in Miami. I don't know why. Well, we all know why, because Miami is actually uh, more Latin uh, than um, than any other um, U.S. city. Um, but from uh, from Miami, um, most of the Vision Fund, which is located for Latin America, goes into Brazil, and we have around about 13 um, unicorns now. The biggest unicorn um, is Newbank, and uh, Newbank is a fintech, uh, which is um, nowadays the third or fourth biggest bank in Brazil. They started um, roughly eight, nine years ago um, and really disrupted uh, the market. They are backed by Warren Buffett as well, and they um, yesterday they announced that they are filing for an IPO in New York and in Sao Paulo Stock Exchange. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things happening, and um, the venture capital investment, as you see, three three billion. Um, this looks nice, but still, there's a huge potential um, um, of growth in it. Um, some prominent areas and um, like health and biotech, which are not all concentrated in um, in the big cities. So it's not all happening just in Sao Paulo, just in Rio. We have, uh, for example, the um, SAP um, startup center and innovation um, center is based in um, in the southern part of Brazil. We have something going on in the center. We have in Minas Gerais. We have in the uh, in the northern part or northeastern part. And um, what I would like to highlight a little bit is that um, public investment is still a little bit shy. So there's huge potential for public investment in this area still. And um, yeah, that's that were my two minutes. And I will head over from uh, South America now to North America. Thanks, sir. And then over to you, Katrin. Yeah, so good morning from New York. And um, I feel like everything has been said and we're a completely sort of different market because we've been there for a long time in entrepreneurship. So we're not this hot new field where you want to go, but we're this well established, very well funded in terms of money uh, market that's here. But nevertheless, let me also give you some numbers because it's always nice uh, to look at them. And like my colleagues, we, we had a little bit of a problem finding the exact numbers for startups that exist in our markets. And I think that's due to the fact that it's just a very fast moving market, right? You, you found something today and then it might be gone in two years, it might be gone tomorrow, um, depending on the circumstances. But I think what we all see is that there's growth and there's still growth and it's still going on. There are small dips, uh, as you can see here in the States, there was a small dip in, in 2016, but in 2021, we've had a record year so far. In terms of um, in terms of deal value and in terms of deal count, and you can see the numbers there for yourself. I mean, 240 billion is a lot compared to 166 billion last year. So we're picking up, and this is a very American thing, also that you can see. You're coming out of a difficult time, and you're moving forward. That's the pioneer spirit. You always want to invest a little bit more. Maybe I want to give you a fun fact, also, uh, which might be interesting to you. I think 69% of all startups, all businesses that are being found, are being found at home. So the garage myth is actually true for the United States. So whatever you do, you know, try and find a garage and, and start your business there. It's always a good, it's always a good piece of advice. In terms of startups, the numbers vary greatly here when you look it up. We have numbers from 68,000 to a current 4.4 million applications for new businesses. So you can see there's a wide range depending on what you count as a startup. Is it just your application or is it actually something that you've been running for a little while? But again, important is that the number is growing and we also have a, a, a huge growth in angel seed funding here right now and also in, in what's called the mega deals. Of course, traditionally, it's always been like that. The majority of the funding or the majority of the capitalized in the Bay Area, 
Although there is small concern this year um, that it might dwindle a little bit and shift more towards the Midwest. So the middle of the country, the, the flyover states. We're still okay here in New York. We're still growing here um, fine. But uh, San Francisco is getting a little bit nervous that your um, venture capitalists are moving to Chicago or to Atlanta or to Miami, which are going to be the next hotspots here um, that we are looking at. Um, here also a few numbers of, of just parameters that we have here. We have a total number of 439 unicorns. That's also been a nice growth and I have to look up. I can't remember numbers all the time. So I think last year we had 190. Um, no, we had a growth of, of uh, let me see. 439 altogether. We had only 78, for example, in 2020. And then in, in, in 2021, we added 194. And there's a funny story. In Chicago alone, we have 14 unicorns already in the year 2021. And every time a new unicorn is, uh, is announced, the city of Chicago celebrates with a, with a huge package of donuts. So I was wondering if there is a correlation between the weight gain of the staff in the city of Chicago and actually the announcement of unicorns, but that remains to be seen. As I said, with 240 billion um, invest right now in the states, and as with all the other markets, there's a lot of focus on the healthcare, medical um, field, biotech, and also environmental applications. If you go west, for example, and this is for science-based startups, but if you go outside of the university environment, a lot of uh, money is put into e-commerce still, and uh, for New York, particularly cyberspace, cybersecurity. I looked up, I tried to look up a number for deep tech science based startups, startups that are attached to university and I found 4,200, but I wouldn't really uh, count that this is, this is the actual uh, number that we have. I am not sure how many there are, but this is the official for 2019 growing again. And then um, incubators are not very well mapped here because you have a large amount of new incubators almost on a daily basis at the colleges and research institutions that we have in the United States. So I found 400, but it's definitely more because if you look up any college here, the tradition has been longstanding over 20 years. Um, it's just something that's built in into the um, educational system here. And that's where I'm going to stop for my two minutes. Thank you. Thanks uh, for, yeah, yeah for that uh, insight and for, for the figures and also the, yeah, the, the trends. Uh, um, yeah, so we had quite, yeah, quite a, Good look on figures right now, but let's start a bit and go into the discussion also on the international aspects. You now, as we're talking about taking your the startup or your incubator inter international, and maybe Sören, I, I kick it off, off with you. So, if one looks at Brazil nowadays, there's a lot of national discourse ongoing. Um, is there an openness for internationalization for yeah, getting startups in, but also for bringing startups maybe to um, outside? So, what is the discussion ongoing at the moment? Yes, you know, the political discourse is a bit focused on, on national aspects, no? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, because what I what I already told you, it's not it's not a huge internal market like um, like India, but still um, in comparison to the whole region, um, when you deal with 220 million um, inhabitants and a very consumer friendly market, um, you you really what we heard about from from other incubators and from the universities that startups first they start local um <clears throat> most of them start really local and and if they if they are in a field where uh, where parts of the product or the service can be exported then eventually they go a little bit international we have some we have some um some federal um, instruments uh, for that for exporting uh, companies but but i would say basically um it's um 90 percent what we heard from uh, from the incubator that 90 percent are, are locally focused and uh, from the other way around like incoming i would say incoming startups it's still a tough market i would say um it's not easy to uh, to do business um in brazil um when you are from latin america i think it's a little bit easier but still um it's it's kind of tough to uh, to understand uh bureaucracy is um is i would say on the german level <laughs> and i wouldn't say that this is um actually good but <laughs> okay when you're from germany you are you're quite uh, familiar with uh, what uh, bureaucracy is um is looking like but we see um some some areas which are very interesting um i would say by bio, biodiversity everything which comes out from biodiversity there's a huge potential still uh, for international startups and for local startups to to jointly um, innovate um, in this area. I would say, like in pharmaceutics, um, cosmetics, and um, I think we are we are 
we are still on the tip of the iceberg, still on uh, discovering everything with the, not just the Amazon forest, but um, all the other um, biodiversity um, areas here um, have to offer. But I would say um, it's, it's opening up um, step by step. And I would say we are here to help and assist you with doing that. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, sir. And we can add on, on, on India a bit on that lines. We also see that there is international drive, and everybody is looking for international contact. Uh, but we are, yeah, have a bit of a challenge gaining interest also from the German side, no, to come, come, come to India. And I think for the US, that's maybe a bit, bit different. So, uh, Katrin, is the US uh, waiting for the Germans and uh, German startups with open arms? And what is about uh, US startups and US incubators going international? First of all, of course, the US is always awaiting everybody with open arms, right? That's we're an immigration country, we're, we're a trade uh, a country here, and we're all, all about business, just to put it very bluntly. Um, yes, but of course, um, the comparison is a little bit, it's like comparing apples and oranges. However, what the United States value very much is the, is the basic research that's coming out of countries like Germany, for example. You have to understand everything that's happening here is very disruptive and done sometimes very fast and very quickly and oftentimes also too quickly and you're missing this this incremental development that's why that's why Pfizer worked so well Pfizer BioNTech for example right because you have the correct mix of of having somebody who's willing to take risk and also invest and then somebody coming in with very very solid uh, basic research so i think this is we should not under, underestimate that we are also the us is also always fascinated by the the craftsmanship and also the engineering cap uh, capacities in in germany that expand um, into other fields like even even artificial intelligence. I mean, I would say that's super interesting. In terms of of both countries, I think they're very much both interior focused in the beginning. The German market is large enough. If you look at it from a perspective of a startup in Germany, and the American market is also large enough from the American perspective. What's interesting for a German though is sometimes you do a detour via the United States to be successful in Germany because you have proof of concept, and it always helps to say, "Hey, I, I made it in the U.S." And then your product automatically becomes more hyped uh, overseas, and um, and I think also for for the United States here it's interesting to look when they look to Europe to start with the largest market there. So there's clearly a lot of uh, symbiosis here, and and uh, with our new um, with our new um, government, with our new administration here, there's also a lot more funding in the direction of applied research, right? So Biden made a very clear statement; he puts a lot of money, billions of dollars behind this idea of applied research. And I think that's where Germany comes in very strong from the transatlantic side. Okay, yeah, and not to forget, uh, of course, there's always personal relations. We, we discussed a lot about India and the US and we have quite a lot of startup founders in India who put the education in, 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 yeah, in, in, in the US and then went to India to found the startup here. But I think public funding and, and uh, also basic funding are just a quite interesting uh, um, yeah, abroad, which I want to take to, to Mikhail, to, to Russia. I mean, I know that Russia has been a strong focus on, on, on fundamental and basic research, and also in the German cooperation with Helen Holz, and so there's a lot of uh, ongoing in, in basic research. Is there an opening up for the, for the startup system, and is the startup system pushed from economics, or is it more like public publicly pushed, like the first push in India came from, from the government programs, or is it is it yeah? Is it something which uh, bottom up comes from the industry? Maybe you can talk about a bit Skolko and give that example. So how is the situation in, in in Russia? Is it bottom up industry or is it a push from the government because one has to step into um, into this innovation chain? Thank you very much for the question. I um, I think that uh, the uh, the Russian market is more open for uh, for bigger companies, not uh, and maybe it's not uh, not really ready for for startups. Um, there are many, there are, there are a lot of uh, German companies on the Russian market, and the Russian market is, is open for the companies, but it's more for sales. And uh, the, I think, uh, uh, as far as I know, the, uh, for, for the Skolko Foundation it's uh, one of the biggest organizations that offer that offers uh, programs for supporting of uh, startups uh, uh, invites international it tries to promote uh, international cooperations in, on the level of startups as well but it's i think it's not uh, it's um, must be more attractive the russian market is must be more attractive for the german uh, startups uh, i think it's not maybe a, it's first on the stage where uh, where the local startups uh, has been have been um, 
uh, that, uh, that uh, on the stage when um, uh, the local ecosystem uh, should be uh, developed and has its uh, occup occupies its niche on the market. Okay, thanks for that. Axel, I have an interesting question, I think, especially for Japan incoming from, from one of our panelists. So uh, there's asking, uh, Carlos Parra is asking, what are the main challenges or the obstacles for international entrepreneurs in the countries? And I think Japan being known as a really close society. So are the obstacles in entrepreneurship in Japan the same for, for somebody who was born and raised in Japan as for somebody maybe who yeah, moved to Japan and now wants to found a startup there? That's interesting. I, um, I I discussed with a gentleman from the uh, the Venture Cafe in Tokyo actually two weeks ago. Um, I, I think there's always an issue about uh, the language barrier, about culture. You have to get used to different business practices. Um, there's a particular setup. I think how you proceed, how you how you <laughs> how you lobby for for funding. Um, and I think that that's that's an issue for Japan, obviously. Um, maybe the hurdle is even bigger um, if, if, because you, you really should know the language, ideally, to to work well in Japan, um, and that does take a lot of time with the uh, the writing system. You know, it takes several years to master that. Um, so the recommendation would really be if you, if you want to be active in Japan, you you need a local partner. You need you need somebody Japanese um, who can maneuver um, the, the language, who can maneuver the culture, and who can ideally also maneuver the regulatory um, barriers. Thanks. Thanks for that. Maybe. I mean, I, I think language is not always not. If you look at India, um, people are speaking um, English, but it's also the cultural approach you mentioned. No, I think I would, yeah, I um, think also so. argue for that because uh, if you would look like just at a discussion with with uh, startups and incubators, uh, say the approach is completely different. So the German would work more continuously and there's yeah. not so much ad hoc taking place. Uh, uh, and then in India, one has to jump on things. There's a lot of things ad hoc taking place. But maybe Katrin or, or Sören, over to you, maybe to cultures which seem to be a bit more close uh, to to um, yeah to Germany, for instance. So are there also these struggles and barriers, or is it a bit easier if I go to a place um, which seems to be culturalized a bit closer to me than probably Japan or uh, India or Russia? I can start to that and be really quick. No, it's it's no difference. I mean, it seems more exotic and it seems much more more stark in the other regions, but it's it's very similar when you come here. And I think that's also that's a danger because you think you know it so well. You think you know it from your TV series and movies and encounters that you've had maybe in your life. But then when you get here, there are so many fine nuances that you need to know um, that can make or break your deal. I mean, the, the the most obvious here, for example, is how do you present yourself? Right? You cannot come with your German presentation style, for example, because you will you will just not make an impression. And I think there is the, so it can be even more dangerous if you think you're too close and you know it all um, than actually already expecting. Well, I don't speak the language. I don't know the culture very well. And then you're more cautious. But here you, you feel almost too comfortable too quickly. So you would like to add on that or? Maybe, maybe um, uh, just adding, I think, um, uh, cultural differences and especially when it comes to uh, language barriers um, are still huge when you don't speak Portuguese, um, especially um, in some areas when, when you really have to do like field work, when you, um, when you work with the agro, agro sector, which is huge here um, in Brazil and in, and in Argentina, for example, um, you really have to speak the language because um, from a... Um, from a certain level, management level on, um, you don't always have someone um, who speaks fluently English uh, with you. So, uh, so this is the first step, and then it's still a little bit more exotic. So, um, when you when you speak about German um, as startups, and what Katrin said, I think makes totally sense because you feel that that uh, that you are more um, more like um, affiliated to I don't know to the United States or um, or to Canada. But on the other hand, um, I think then you then you leave out the uh, nuances. But once you are here, I think then you really get um, you, then you really um, appreciate the Brazilian market because it's once you understand all the rules and uh, where you want to talk to, then it's I would say it's 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 rather quite it's not it's not easier. But I would say it's really um, you have a really interesting ecosystem here where you can really uh, evolve, where you can pitch, um, uh, develop, um, um, improve 
your product and um that's what i really wanted to um to point out here is like once you once you jump above this quite high uh, uh barriers then i think you were i wouldn't say then you're in safe waters but um you were um uh, you really get to appreciate the market and i think axel will wants, wants, to jump <laughs> yes, yes. wants to jump over the barrier of the uh japanese cultural yeah i, I wanted to add something to <laughs> maybe um make it seem less less daunting a task to to expand to japan because on the one hand there's the language barrier there's the you know the local business customs and everything but what, what i find fascinating i'm not sure whether we're comparing experiences now and i'm not sure whether that's the uh, the same for all countries because it seems to me that uh, japan is actually trying to 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 attract international startups and that I, I find quite fascinating because you would intuitively think well that's first of all competition maybe to local companies but there are a lot of public um venues that are engaged trying to attract and, and support international comp corporations um i, I talked to uh, it's it's a a, a municipal uh, um it's, it's a startup support organization um run by the by tokyo um prefecture and um, they have a program um, where foreign um, startups could apply. Um, and uh, it was amazing to see. I, I think that they had, had a slot for, for 10 uh, startups um, that, that would receive um, intensive support. And they had 400 applications, a third of which I think came from Europe, also with a significant amount of applications from, from Germany. And, and even more interesting, because we talked about the issue that a lot of startups first want to stay local. But in fact, a lot of startups that apply from outside Japan, they're actually at a, at a very, very early stage. So I thought that was actually quite, quite fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> nothing which we normally see in the in the in the trends now, which is. Uh, but maybe let's let's come back. with we have talked a bit about soft landing, cultural barriers, and uh, and uh, and so on. Maybe we, we can have a look a bit, and I think it's good what you brought up, Axel, but funding support mechanisms is an openness for for internationalization and uh, you could see this also maybe on the level i think startups they want one level the other level is uh, maybe also incubators who would like to go international and say i would like to reach out to a counterpart and to see what's uh, what's ongoing there so we high for a country which is earlier which is you now maybe a couple of years still to go where uh, to reach a certain stage nevertheless you before we talked a bit, there are a lot of support mechanisms um, available in Russia, and there's a lot of, of money in the system to make it sustainable. Maybe you can give a short uh, outlook uh, what's happening in, 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 the, in with this funding support mechanisms and where one could look, uh, for instance, for, for support. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katja, for the question. Uh, as I have already said, it's uh, there are new structures that appeared or uh, were established 10, about 10 years ago, and uh, one of the biggest me mechanism uh, is uh, the Skolko Foundation. It's, uh, it's a foundation near to near to Moscow that offers uh, um, that offers programs uh, for so for supporting for startups and not only for local startups but also for international startups. It's it's a question that not uh, it, uh, Skolko. It's a question that uh, it has. Uh, when the program exists, it's not. It doesn't mean that uh, it, will, it will work, yeah, because uh, the structure uh, should be uh, created and should uh, uh, should take a place on the market. Uh, but um, there are different different mechanisms for international cooperation, and not only from the Skolko Foundation, but also from the um, uh, there is a there is. A, a foundation for small uh, innovative enterprises that was established also to, to about uh, eight years um, for, um, ago. It's, it's called show for short uh, FASI, and it has uh, it, it had a common project. It had a, a common um, program with the BMBF with the with the, with the ministry uh, ministry for science and uh, research. And now it has uh, and it has a program that offers a program with the uh, EU, uh, with the uh, European Union, in the framework of the uh, of the program Horizon 2020. There are, there are a lot of instruments for for uh, international cooperation, and especially and for bilateral cooperation with uh, with Germany. Thanks for that. I think that holds true for 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 a lot of countries. But you mentioned the BMBF, and I think that that leads us a bit. Uh, to the question of how we can support you know, all, all the five of us are working in different countries and uh, 
we in daily looking for instance at the moment uh, what is our yeah what could be our support mechanism for incubators and startups um, just reflecting uh, reliable networks reliable partners especially in new systems finding the right partner maybe is one approach one one could have and this is something we are we are offering to yeah to lead german startups incubators through the uh, huge uh, system which we have in place in india but maybe uh, from um, each of us could name one aspect as time is running unfortunately i just see one aspect uh, how your center for research innovation or house for research and innovation could help uh, for internationalization uh, startups or incubators who might choose uh, in in your country and i start with uh, again from the east to the west and then maybe we finish with india this time but uh, axel maybe you could name one one thing the german center for research and innovation is offering uh, our participants here to go international, be it startup incubator. So I one got a first advantage. mover advantage now. <laughs> I can pick <laughs> anything. <laughs> but I think the, the the big strength really of the German houses of research and innovation is the con the connectedness. Um, we have the the DWRH supporters. We are connected to to local organizations from politics, from research, universities. That I think is is really something where we where, where we can support um, both startups and incubators because we can can point them the way and and um, make contacts to the right people. Um, yes, I go with India last this time. It's the advantage of being the moderator. <laughs> Over you, to you, Mikhail. Uh, what uh, how the uh, the the have Moscow can can serve and can support the international. I agree absolutely. Uh, uh, um... Alex has already said that uh, that um, what we can do if we can we can help uh, to network and to bring uh, people together from Germany and in our case with uh, with Russian universities or to Russian and can uh, I can maybe add that uh, and can inform about the uh, about the current um, uh, programs or initiatives uh, and so on and what we what we offer we, we offer the platform for the particularly for the dialogue between uh, Germany and other countries, and in our case, we take part. I'm sure that other in other countries will be the same the uh, the same um, thing. That uh, for example, we take part in uh, different fairs, technological fairs, with stands when we offer when we where uh, we offer a German research organization, but also the comp technological comp uh, technological oriented companies uh, to present themselves and to, to uh, organize uh, meetings with, uh, in our case, with the Russian partners. And uh, we can do it and we do, we do it uh, with pleasure. <laughs> Okay, so we have information and networks, partners, we have fairs, we can arrange meetings. So, uh, what what else is uh, on the yeah maybe the maybe maybe not just to um to repeat what my former colleagues already said and uh, just to jump in uh, to specific programs and I think uh, Katrin will follow up on this as well. She already posted this uh, within the chat. Um, so we are actually uh, participating in the Startups Connected program, which is organized by the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. And uh, normally we we choose a German startup uh, to come to Brazil and to participate. And uh, they uh, they get a, a week full of, um, well, not really training, but um, in interesting contracts, um, contacts in industry or wherever they want to launch their product or um or market so uh, uh, this is one aspect and the other one is that we are uh, currently developing um an innovators weeks um this will be in the first or second quarter of 2022 um for uh, german um like entrepreneurial minded students or early stage startups to come to brazil to get to know the market so because we all we all heard about the different challenges and um and yeah i would say Barriers, um, soft barriers, hard barriers um, to come to not so well known markets, and um, so yeah, this will be two um, two specific problems to to tackle this. And the other one is um, as well what I already what all my other um, colleagues already said is I think really use the um, German Centers for Research and Innovation and all their um, members and or associated members and all their uh, knowledge to to get access and. Um, People here are very open, um, especially when it comes to when you're an incubator or um, when you're a startup and you, you have something which really would make sense here in the markets, um, contact us, um, communicate us your idea and we will 
try to help you with this. I think exploring markets, Kathleen, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> already I, posted I, something I, in the chat, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll do, be very fast so the moderator can have the last uh, two minutes. So now I want to reiterate what, what Sören just said. What you have here with the five of us sitting here, you have the whole world at your fingertips. So use us. Don't don't hesitate. Use us. Go on LinkedIn, link with us, whatever. We can really help you. And I just want to point out one um, program that we're doing here at the DVE High in New York for the first time. We partnered with the German American Chamber of Commerce. They already have an existing program that's called STEP for startups, where they invite startup groups uh, to New York. Usually right now it's virtually. We kind of say it's like getting a driver's license. You do, you do the theory part first, you do it virtually, and then you come to New York when you're a little bit you know, more established. What I want to say about the program, I posted in the chat, you can apply. We're sponsoring it with 80% of the cost uh, from the DVE high here. And don't be afraid if you're super, super, super early stage. So this is really for, for everybody who has the slightest idea of I'm interested in the international markets. So don't think you have to be established. You don't have to have a full product yet or um, a prototype or whatever. Check it out and, and, and take a look. And this is what we're trying to establish more and more from the side of the Center for Research um, and Innovation. Yeah, then maybe I made it two minutes left. Good, <laughs> and yeah, we can also. <laughs> so, uh, if we, I mean, all of us have said, medical league is also true, true uh, for India, and uh, we're also working on specific programs, um, developing, uh, in developing into a tandem project next year with the aim to bring German entrepreneurs to India to partner them up in an incubator in India, and then to let them work on a problem and on a challenge. Uh, but we are also running the Falling Walls Lab, for instance, in India, um, where Indian startups can pitch and um, manage this year to have the German incubators uh, on board who had a look. There's been a lot of contacts established besides the fact that the winner uh, gets a nice uh, trip um, trip uh, to Berlin. But we are also working uh, on the field of interconnecting incubators. Uh, so this event is one, one part of it. And uh, in December, uh, so I will maybe look at our website or you can post it in the chat. We will run a dedicated event to uh, connect incubators from India and Germany, offering the opportunity to yeah get an overview on the systems, but also dedicated B2B meetings on a platform for two days. So this is a, something a bit of a different direction, but as I said, information meetings we are we are also running as the DV Hanu Daily. This hour went fast, really fast, I have to say. <laughs> It was flying, but it's, it was a first. So let us know or also if that's been interesting, we could take that up. Uh, but before we come to an end, maybe each of you gives uh, one suggestion to a startup who wants to go international in country. So my suggestion to a German startup who wants to get a footstep into the market XYZ is and one sentence per person and Sören, you go first. Oh, I was still I was still um, trying to figure out my um, my sentence, but I would say um, uh, don't be afraid. Um, uh, try to make errors and really um, uh, do these errors in a very early stage, a very early stage, and also already think about um, um, going global in these early stages. Because if you fail, you can already stand up again in these early stages, and you don't have a huge structure you have to deal with. And do it um, on a very early stage level and um, contact us, use us, use all the programs you have. Good, Axel. Um, I, I think it's very important that you that you connect yourself, that you meet people. So make use of all the opportunities to, to connect with the um, startup scene on site. Um, I, I posted some things into the chat, some, some venues that you can use, matchmaking um, organizations, for example, and others. Okay, um, yeah, Michai, what you would say as a... The uh, to try it, <laughs> try it if you if you have an idea, that then uh, try it. And I think uh, there is uh, programs for everything and for every country. In every country, you can find a program that you can feed or can help you to uh, uh, can, can support your project, your startup. Uh, try it and networking. Networking is the most important thing, I think, in this case. Yeah, that's it to New York, over to you. I'm trying not to repeat networking, which of course is very important, but you all said it. So I want to say, I want to give you a few pieces of advice. Don't ever hesitate. No idea is too crazy to not pursue it and not try to, to make it come to life. Actually, to, to life, yes. Start very, very early. Even if you just have an idea, start thinking broader than what your horizon currently is. And there are absolutely no, I cannot do it. 
that's my little spiel. Okay, good. I would add on this, no borders, neither in your mind, neither country-wise, so just do it as it was said. And I would suggest for India, just come over, don't be afraid of flying in, sit together with the Indian creative minds maybe, discuss the idea, get different perspectives, working together um, 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 on the local, local scene, broaden your perspectives and then develop your idea further or your product your product further. As I said, this has been really fast, I have to say. I'm so glad that you all joined my, my, my panel from all over the world, literally. And I think that's one thing the pandemic has taught us. No, uh, going virtual is so easy and uh, it's not by any chance that this was the first yeah, common event uh, by the five houses. Even we have to bridge a lot of time zones and, uh, and, and continents. There have been a couple of Questions regarding the slides and the information, we will compile them and mail them to everybody uh, who registered for that uh, event, so we we'll provide them um, um, uh, next next week. So what remains for me is thank you for getting up early, Katrin <laughs> and Søren, for your insights, uh, for uh, giving us an insight in an early system, Mihai, from, from, from Russia and uh, also for Axel for connecting. Uh, from Bonn and giving us an insight into the Japanese society. It has been a wonderful experience. I hope we will repeat that uh, pretty pretty soon. So uh, for the audience, as I mentioned, uh, we will provide you the information. Check up the websites of the German Centers for Research and Innovation. I think we post them in a minute in the in the chat. The next upcoming events are the STEP US program, which was presented by Katrin and the Incubators Connect in, uh, 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 from the day behind the daily. So uh, have a look at things, explore what we have to offer. We are looking forward to yeah, touch base with you to discuss with you further. We are obviously in the flow and developing things. So thanks so much for joining today. Thanks to my DBI colleagues for organizing the um, events. You can imagine there is uh, a lot of colleagues in the background and we did a lot of uh, work for that event. So thanks to them. And I, it rains for me, have a nice day or have a nice lunch break, remaining lunch break, Axel, or have a nice uh, afternoon for India and, and uh, Japan, and hope to see you soon uh, in this virtual forum. Thanks so much, Katja, for setting up. Thank you, Katja. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye.